So, the next speaker is Anna. You can come over here. Anna is going to tell us about the NSAUR, that's the NSA Parliamentary um, Committee that started in um, March 2014. And since then, it was supposed to look into the activities of the German Secret Services. And you will look into this whole thing and you will look into the future as well. Among other things, you um, are participating in a podcast, you're writing about this for the web website netspolitik.org and I would uh, ask you to give a hand of applause to Anna. Okay. Well, okay. You can hear me? Great. So I'm Anna or A.B. And for the next minutes, you will hear some things about the NSA and Commonwealth Parliamentary Committee. And um, part of it will be about my own impressions. I usually sit in there and I'm writing a live blog about this since Andre is on holidays. And because of that, I was also asking, I have somehow, I have a very limited view, so I asked what uh, people are, what you guys are interested in, so there were a lot of answers to that, many, many questions. For example, what's the atmosphere like? That was asked a lot. How much do these people actually want to... Um, clear up things, how did it, how did it work with the stateless uh, satellites, how is this related to the Illuminati? So but let's start with the question what this parliamentary committee is actually supposed to do, because that's what we need to know to see where and understand what the problems are. Well, so this parliamentary co committee was um, instituted in March 2014 after the first Snowden revelations. So it took a while to for the government, uh, it took a while for um, this committee to be instituted and to decide what it was actually supposed to do. And initially, the general focus was for uh, was on the activities of the Five Eyes in Germany. Those, that's um, an organization or basically a, an institution where these five big secret services work together. And the question was, what do the, are these Five Eyes doing in Germany? Are there any things they're doing that are illegal? And how were German institutions involved in that? And how much did they know about that? And to what extent did they maybe profit from that? Um, by um, drawing on this illegally obtained knowledge. And some uh, institutions we're talking about is the German um, si signal, uh, signal intelligence service. And some things uh, that we're talking about, well, they look into, they are spying on EU institutions, how does stuff that work, stuff like that. Another question is, how much is Germany involved in this secret war? And the secret war is basically what the Americans are doing with their drones. And so the question was, were there, was there information that came from Germany that was used for um, illegal murders? Um, they were also talking to people who were seeking asylum. And how was this? How is this knowledge used? So these people were interviewed in Germany. And because there needs to be some kind of result, um, what do we have to change so for th in order for this um, spying by uh, other secret services in Germany to stop? And how do we maybe control our own secret services? So the parliamentary consists of eight members and eight substitutes. There's always one from the opposition, from the Greens, two from the um, Social Democrats, and three from the Christian Democratic Union. And on the picture you can see there's like a back row, and there you see people who are um, from the for foreign servers, from the different ministries, uh, from the secret service, and they're kind of paying attention. Somehow they get, a, sometimes they get a bit nervous, and they're kind of watching all of this. So the parliamentary committee meets every Thursday, in, uh, when there are weeks where the Bundestag, the parliament meets, and sometimes there are extra meetings. And the crazy thing is that it actually lasts until midnight sometimes. Um, at midnight they actually have to stop because the sten stenographers um, have to stop working as opposed to us. Well, and we're sitting there, we write live blogs, we have 41 of those by now. We do this 
we're, the reason we're doing this is that the public can come to these meetings, but there are no official protocols that you can access. So you either go, which is a bit difficult if you have, for example, a nine to five job, especially if you don't live in Berlin, or you can't go. And the only thing you could then read is what is being reported in the press. So we wanted to give people the opportunity to inform themselves. So we thought it was really important to have these live blogs. So by now we've written something like more than three million characters. Um, I counted that at some point. And what we think is um, <laughs> really an honor for us is that apparently the, um, the secret German Secret Service is actually reading these blogs as well. So, well, apparently some people don't really like that we're doing this, but we think that everyone should have the right to know what's happening there. This. Aber Leute, die dann well, people who are actually putting much more work into this and who are actually dealing with this 24-7 are basically the members of the parliament, especially people who are working for them, who sometimes do amazing work in the background. And I actually asked one of the secretary, secretariat, and they say they now have 2,319 folders. There are more than one million pieces of paper. And that's the stuff that they wrote about um, or that they compiled for certain questions where they said, oh, we're interested in this, and then they compiled background information. And out of these 2,319 folders, 520 folders are rated top secret or secret. There's something that's top secret, there's some that are less secret. And that's a huge problem of this parliamentary committee because, it's, of course, it makes the work much more difficult as well because somehow they have to deal with these uh, secret folders. Um, suddenly, um, people who work for members of the parliament need to be need get to get a background check. Some of these folders they can only read in certain places. Well, it probably looks a bit like you have a folder that's not secret, and then suddenly it says, oh, this part um, we was taken out, and then you go to a specific place, you can look into it, but you can't take any notes, you can't take any photos, and can just hope that you don't forget anything about it. So this is actually making the work, uh, like the work that the people in the committee are doing much more difficult as well. Another problem, even if you have the folders, is, well, sometimes you see um, who is being greeted and that somebody said, well, greetings, but you often don't see much else. And then we also have another problem that a lot of documents are missing. We had one meeting in October 2014 that was interrupted right away. Um, when, they, when they found out that one of the people who was supposed to testify had documents that the committee themselves didn't have. So it's really difficult to find all these documents, to compile them in one place, to give them to the people who are actually supposed to do this work. And often information is being kept back and people hope that this is not coming out. So also we don't know what is missing because we don't have an overview of the documents that we're supposed to have. Another problem of the parliamentary committee is this is a citation from a former mem president of the Federal Intelligence Service of Germany which, um, who said the, U the US are the elephant, we are the pony. What they mean is that we're dependent on the US and apparently according to the opinion of um, our secret services, we're dependent on the information they give us, um, dependent on the technology they can give us. Um, on stuff that the uh, Federal Secret Service doesn't have. So basically they say, well, we can't change anything about this. We just have to give them um, information because otherwise they don't want to play with us anymore and they won't give us any more anymore that we actually need. And that's basically what they also what they're uh, the um, attitude that we have towards the Brits, where basically the Brits just tell us, well, if you, there's more, there are more documents that come to the public and to light, then we'll just won't give you any information anymore. We don't really believe that, but well, that's an attitude that's preventing um, people from clearing this up. A further problem that we have is that obviously that this, this committee is under intense scrutiny from external secret services where well, we had several notices that there were weird things happening on, on mobile phones that members, for example, to the 15, something, something weird was going on. There was the famous Marcus R who was spying for the USA and, was, and also told them information about this inquiry committee. Well, we have to ask ourselves to what extent 
is this was this being uh, committee being put under pressure and to what extent are the witnesses being pressured and how does it work if even the people members of the if the uh, people in making the inquiries are not sure if they're being surveilled themselves a further problem we have is not just Mr. Wolf from the uh, presidential uh, but also the general attitude towards uh, affirmations by the witnesses. The continuously, they say, well, you can't say this openly. For example, when it's talking to talk about methods or details. Well, for example, what, what their view of what is a detail is not always our view of the detail. What is a detail? The problem is with this non-public statement, they, they don't always um, name just things that are non shouldn't be that are big, but they also include things that are just not very co convenient or comfortable. And well, we believe that just because it's embarrassing, it should still be brought to the public. And just because it's not open, or well, we don't have a possibility as as the as the public to learn about these sessions that are being called as called non-public we we don't know what really is being said under exclusion of the public it's secret there's no protocols we don't have any information and therefore it's very difficult to realize if it's really being done properly a further problem is apart from non-public is not part of the investigation which where this this committee should uh, investigate anything that's since 2001, everything that's before is very difficult, and the exclusion of anything that is, isn't part of the investigation is often in the hands of Mr. Wolf, who is part of the government, and and, and these, this uh, federal secret agency uh, overview is always behind him, and who always uh, very nervously, you know, speaks into the microphone when he thinks something isn't part of the investigation but there were there have been witnesses who in an incredible sense of arrogance who said no or this isn't part of the investigation they, they came to as an absurd scene when a witness was asked well this this uh, branch where you're working were the were the US Americans there well he said well that's not part of the inquiry and that's before the inquiry so well so he was asked well, you can say that. It says it says in the Wikipedia. Just because it's like that, I don't have to say that in front of this committee. The, these are scenes that you, we can witness, which are extremely frustrating. A further problem is, especially witnesses per, from the Secret Service have a very limited freedom to say things. Even the president of Schindler was interrupted by Mr. Wolf when he when he was asked if, if the Bundeskanzleramt has been informed, um, the Mr. Wolf said, well, to this, you, you're not allowed to speak to this. Well, this is really absurd sometimes. A further problem that we have is a, <laughs> is a lawyer, Mr. Eisenberg, who is represents to be in, uh, the Secret Service, who isn't always isn't just is just not always ranting and talking but he's also causing problems because because he represents many witnesses and we have to assume that he he influences and puts uh, witnesses under pressure with things that they really shouldn't know for we often, for example we often had cases where the witnesses somehow always all use the same example or all the, the witnesses had knowledge that they really shouldn't have and often you can like agree between witnesses what they should say and shouldn't say uh, what, another problem is amnesia. Um, somehow amnesia is very frequent, especially in areas where you ask what the hell are people been doing, where well, they don't know on what legal basis they've been doing things, um, where we can assume, well, maybe they really didn't know. Well, it's a big problem anyway. Another problem is the Berlin Hour, that is the division, subdivision of, of talking time. And because since the Conservatives have four people, they have a lot of time to talk, about 45%, that's 27 minutes. In contrast, the Greens and the left party only each have eight minutes. Well, you can think, you can imagine how that works. It is not, they're not very long. And often in the, from the Conservatives, they're very meaningless questions. If to really, to really corner a, a witness, there's very little time. Due to the limited time that the committee has, it's very difficult. Right. Well, now you've heard a bit about the problems. Well, now let's hear what has it 
cleared up? What has it discovered? For example, we discovered that the D6 in Frankfurt has for the Secret Service is um, filters off, siphons off the transfer you know, since 2008. From there, it, it's transferred to Pulach, to, and then it was sent to Bad Eibling. And from there, there are there are there's data that the NSA somehow gets, and the BND in exchange, the BND, the Secret Service gets some equipment. This this was um, ordered via G10 order. So, um, in, in order to um, cover the tr the uh, traffic of traffic transfer of traffic from Germany, from Germans inside and outside, in order to do this, is um, what we simply did. We said, well, we just simply get everything from the from that node. Well, there will be traffic from both people from there will be both traffic from Germans and also as other traffic that we would like to come divide with with the NSA. Das Ganze wurde the whole thing was, was, by the, was being kept secret, but it, not even the G10 Commission was informed in the way that it should have been. And the committee was was told a, a witness by a witness. Well, they they drove us to Frankfurt. There were a lot of <laughs> lots of, lot of shiny lights and lots of cables, and they told us, well, this, 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 and this. But the, since the commission is small and has little support, what, what, what the hell are they supposed to realize? And, and the people in the G10 commission were, were get, got very angry about this. The former president of the commission who later on came out and said, well, they've, they basically tricked us. And the former uh, secret service uh, uh, president said, well, I have no idea if they were informed or not. Well, as, as always, we, we meet a big wall of ignorance or silence. Well, the other thing that gave us food for thought is that even the telecom was was skeptical and said, "Well, we're not really sure if that's if that's say, if that's legal or not." Well, there was some kind of dinner between the um, former Secret Service uh, President Hanning and the head of telecom Hanning. The Hanning didn't fond remember it very fondly, or the big Secret Service President said, "Oh, it was all fine." And then there was a letter from the government that said, who, who told the telecom, "Ah, oh, it's all fine." It, just keep doing it, it's all fine. Well, s and then since 2014, 255 cables or lines from various lenders, uh, countries was redirected, and for that the telecom received 6,000 euros a month in exchange. And there was a, they just rented a room in the, uh, in that same building just to directly grab the optical fiber. Well, how? let's think about how the ticket service thought about it. There was a great um, quote, in my opinion, from a former former member who's, who was asked, was it a trick? I mean, is it, is it, is this order, is it the, the order to, to, act to grab the external traffic legal and you can take everything? It said, it's not no trick. That's the use of legal means with uh, desired side effects. And these desired legal side effects seems to be somewhat the seems to be somewhat of a theme with the BND. So the next thing we discovered was that the the capturing of satellite data and the filtering with the, with the famous NSA selectors with, with which the data for the data from Germany was selected for the NSA, which wasn't always completely legal. For example, EU politicians, for example, Germans, for example, uh, companies like Eurocopter, even though since 2005 we knew they were surveilling the EU company, we didn't. They didn't th think of of using that as a reason to check this more thoroughly. They only did that. Uh, after the commission was formed in 2014, it was told that there were 40,000 selectors which were against EU or German interests. Obviously, the, the, selector, the total number of selectors is much greater. We don't know exactly. But the Süddeutsche uh, estimated about 10 million. Well, we don't know how many of these there are. Oh, the, the ones in 10 million which are not legal because we don't we're not allowed to see it the ones that the secret, secret agent wanted to uh, um, in order to prevent it they, they, they created a filter which is called DAFIS which is the filter for the data collection system 
and in order to to filter those people who are covered by basic law, they had a three-layer filtering system. Um, first level was filtering um, prefixes, people with the German prefixes or German uh, domains. Um, the fact that people from Germany use org address, addresses or Citra, well, they didn't care about this, The second level was to filter out, filter out companies like Siemens.com, which they certainly knew were part of Germany, even if they have a couple of domains in Germany outside of Germany. And the third layer was things that were German from context, for example. For example, if people were talking about a German company in the abroad, they knew they, they were took out. But they knew, we also know that the layers two and three weren't really effective until 2003. And also, obviously, that the system can only filter that which it knows. And if it's not being maintained, well, it obviously doesn't filter anything. And obviously, only on the filter system were active. A further the problem is that the NSA, that the, uh, NSA uh, was uh, providing so-called equations. And many witnesses said that they couldn't really read these so-called equations. There are some weird cryptic formulas, but they couldn't really understand them. The practice in the in the B and D in the Secret Service was to just use the ones they didn't understand. They've since changed their method. Then. We have this famous sentence, our chancellor, since from the beginning, when they when they were still hoping that well this whole thing wasn't being would be discovered, that not just EU companies like Eurocopter, but but you know friendly embassies, and the French exterior ministry, etc. etc. being under under uh, surveillance, but also the NSA, not just the NSA selectors were a problem, but also the Secret Service selectors. BND has the Secret Service built its own selectors. And some of these selectors were being were, were taken open by the NSA, so they were all right. Well, they'll just we'll use the ones that the Secret Service has already put in place. Well, we, we ask ourselves, how does this, how does this kind of check for these selectors work? Well, I've tried to make create a diagram out of these out of these protocols we, to figure out what the hell went wrong, and uh, here you can see it. <laughs> Well, then we d I decided I will, I will, I will, I'm not going to explain in detail, I'm just going to say what the problem was. So the first problem was in 2005, 2006, well, there was a problem. There's the, we noticed that it was Eurocopter. We didn't, did, they didn't use that as a excuse to check if there were other things. Well, because we know we're all, all trustworthy friends, so we don't, we, there's no reason to doubt anyone. So 2013, we started, started checking the selector checking from two directions. So, so the one side told the other, you check this. And there was at the same time, there was another check in a different place. So the person who was in charge of the filtering system, who was, um, who was in charge of putting things in the filter, wasn't tall until 2015. So somehow there was a problem with the communication channels. And several people told us to confirm this view. Yeah, well, we, we didn't tell anyone else. For example, well, we didn't think it was important, so we didn't know how important it was, so no one should, was meant to know, etc., etc., these kind of excuses. So for the, the government, even apparently only was informed officially in 2015 that there was a problem. So the, uh, the people who were in charge, the watchdogs, failed because they apparently weren't told about it. Then you can sort out, you can think about, well, it would be interesting to look at this, this, this list, but the government said, no, you're not allowed to see it because the USA told us told us they don't like it. Then the USA said, well, we didn't say that. I don't know. I don't know what kind of problem you have. Then it became a bit unbelievable, and there were some creative uh, ideas for why solutions for why you couldn't see it. Oh well, it's because of copyright now, because the USA has a copyright on it. Yep, indeed. Instead, we had a, a, a guy in, in charge of the selectors who was supposed to look at the selectors and was supposed to, to tell uh, the investigation committee. We had a little problem with that. And 
this NSA special detective uh, Graulich was uh, sent by the government who said in interviews that he'd be loyal towards his um, employer and yeah, this employer who tried to um, hinder any any discoveries and that's not really a compromise and the opposition uh, sued against it and the declaration of uh, Graulich was pretty limited and he just he said he just had to make a little uh, overview and he did it in Berlin and the BND um, em employees helped him. In the beginning of November he put down his review, he um, made a little selection and wrote three little um, things, one for the committee, one for the chancellery, and that's an inherent problem because there is a yeah, f fall of, of information where the committee has inf uh, infos, the chancellery has not the info the chancellery has, and the more uh, infos he has, he doesn't give us, and not even corporations get to know if they have been surveilled illegally. It's a, it's a farce, and we can't really know what went wrong. And we, we don't. He, he finds the end that the NSA is a bit evil and tricked the, NS, the BND, which is a bit bullshit, which one had to look at, but somewhat, some, somehow one trusted their American friends so much one didn't take a look. And the Mr. Graulich had an interest, interesting uh, look on juristics, for, for example, um, privacy or um, privacy laws causes all went auto automatically through a machine and nobody looked at it and there's no problem with laws because we didn't have to do anything bad. And then he um, wrote off from the BND and did little errors like um, took wrong abbreviations that are not uh, used uh, normal, normally, where he didn't use the normal abbreviation VGL, but used VGL, which is exactly the lingo of the BND, and took the, the look at law from the BNS and uh, and said this is my look at law and further problem is that we don't really know what technical expertise he has. He has pretty nice, wrote a pretty nice article about um, uh, but he, on the other hand, he couldn't hold to, to um, things out of each other, email and chat. And to, to numbers uh, and defended himself um, that we asked too hard, maybe we, and went too hard on him for his technical errors, and he knows, but this is just what's written there. That means, just to sum up, this um, Mr. Garlich is not really um, a technical expert. He's definitely um, a law person, a legally trained person, maybe not even a bad person. But basically, the Federal Intelligence Service, the BND, explained to him what happened. And of course, that the view we got from him was theirs. So I think it's really interesting. There are a lot of other interesting understandings of the law that the um, intelligence service has. For example, when it comes to um, data retention in Bad Eibling, um, that is definitely in Germany, and but because that's abroad, it doesn't really count. And so the German law is not applicable there. So the question is, well, how do you come to this understanding? Well, you come to an interesting understanding like that if you're trying to evade certain laws. And basically what they say, well, what's happening in Bad Eibling that kind of happens um, in space because it goes via satellites, and that's why it's not in Germany. So German laws don't apply.
There were several um, people who testified, who also testified that that is definitely not a majority opinion, which they take over anyway because someone has to fit and somehow the law has to fit what's happening in Bad Aibling. And then even um, in the BND, you have people who are responsible for privacy and data protection. And there was Mrs. F, who also said that she doesn't share this opinion and she has massive concerns, but in the end she doesn't have anything to say, despite her not ha only having one superior, the direct superior, which is the president of the intelligence servers. Um, so basically she t she told him that he's a bit concerned, uh, she's a bit concerned about this and she don't think what's happening is okay, and the president just says, well, we don't really care and we just do it anyway. And th that's also what the president told the committee. Well, he said, well, there were a lot of concerns in this house and that's why we hired her. We were very thankful for her to her for having her own opinion, but we decided differently anyways. Then we also have um, virtual foreign countries or virtual foreign ground. Virtual foreign ground always happens when you um, take some data in Frankfurt and this data, these data, this data is not um, German because it's in Frankfurt but it's coming from abroad and it's going abroad. So it's basically foreign. And well, if we can't really sort out um, the German traffic that's going through Frankfurt, well, that's a shame but we are trying at least. Then we have the um, theory of people who have important um, positions. The idea is that if there is a German person abroad who is working for an important foreign company, then this person is not really um, protected by the German basic law because then we can just simply spy on this person. Of course, this looks different if this person is abroad and is calling um, their family back in Germany because then this person is only acting as a German person and not as a person in an important position. We can all think about how realistic it is to kind of like separate these things and because basically how you separate it because you have to look at what's being said so you're already spying on these people. That way you could also say that, well, for for example, Mr. Oettinger, who is com commis commissioner at the European Union, he's also an important position. We can also spy on him. We can um, spy on um, de uh, development aid workers on the uh, German Red Cross. Everyone you can kind of find abroad. Another interesting understanding of the law that apparently a lot of people seem to share is that there is no mass surveillance. This is actually a direct citation from a parliament member, member of parliament of the Conservative pa Party. If you have have a hundred cookies and you only eat one, is that mass? Is that a mass? Well, basically the same, we have so much data every day, so many messages, and only one percent of these messages are actually looked at. So that's not really mass surveillance and mass retention. And that's also where we need to be aware of this absurdity, where people tell us there is no mass surveillance, it's all targeted. And then they tell us, well, we're saving telephone numbers, we're saving metadata, this is not related to people, um, especially if it's abroad, that we, we don't even have the data, we can't look up who these numbers be not belong to. This is also something that Mr. Graulich who was supposed to look into these things for the government um, took over. And basically, we're going back to what Mr. Pofala, a member of the German Chancellery earlier the, early in the affair said, who said, well, we declared this affair to be over. Another interesting um, part that the committee is looking at is the secret war. A central question in this question about this uh, secret war is uh, Rammstein. This is a U.S. Uh, Air Force base in Germany, which plays a central role in this uh, secret war. And there they look at definitions again and again at details because the U.S. Americans often say, well, there's nothing being steered from Rammstein and these drones are not being controlled from Rammstein. What they overlooked conveniently is that Rammstein may not be a place where these things are being controlled, but it's a relay station where so these signals are being um, are going via Rammstein and are being sent basically to the regions where the drones are then flying. But basically they say, well, we're not controlling anything there, we're just um, conveying the signals that it wouldn't work without Rammstein is not uh, something they would talk about. We don't know any of any other bases that um, could take the role of Rammstein. And there is one being built in Italy, but so far it all goes via Germany. We know one um, guy who was a drone pilot who also said that data and information from Germany, telephone numbers, um, geo coordinates, these things were being given to the U United States. And based on this information, drone strikes were actually being 
um, done and people were killed based on this information. And where is this stuff coming from? We don't know all of this. We know that some of this is actually coming from interviews with asylum seekers in Germany. Um, a while ago, we actually got a catalog of, we actually published a catalog of criteria for asylum seekers because so they would know which asylum seekers the um, Intel federal intelligence service um, is actually interested in. But um, the Comic Sans MS font is original. But this this is not the original document. We basically um, try to make a mock version of it. But so far, I've never um, if I've, I've never seen a catalog like this about criteria regarding people that's more disgusting and that's uh, disrespecting people even more, and then it's also written in Comic Sans. So uh, this institution that we're talking about is actually in a part of the German transfer unit that's hidden within the German transfer unit, but that's actually part of the Federal Intelligence Service. And it was not only the German Secret Service that actually interviewed these asylum seekers, but there were also people from the US Secret Services who by themselves interviewed these asylum seekers. The woman who was responsible for this institution said, well, I, we didn't have any other way, we didn't have enough people. So sometimes they just put interns um, in the corner next to the US Secret Service members. So this institution for interviewing asylum seekers was then uh, Dis disbanded at some point, but we know that it's probably still there and it maybe just has a different name, but likely still um, operates and interviews asylum seekers without telling these asylum seekers that are actually talking to a member of the Secret Service right now. And there are so many other topics, and I'm sure it's going to continue. This parliamentary committee is going to go on until the end of this legislative period. And also, aside from the parliamentary committee, there were a lot of things that were happening. For example, um, a few few trials. The first trial is um, the opposition suing the government in front of the German Constitutional Court, where they're trying to make the government show them the NSA selectors, because the argument is that the United States don't have the right to prevent the government from giving information to the opposition, because there's no harm to uh, the good of Germany. And there's also no harm of this, coming, uh, of this becoming public, because this is being given to members of parliament, especially members of the um, committee, because if you consider these uh, uh, because if you consider them a security risk, then nothing can happen in this committee anyway. On top of that, because you think something might be embarrassing, it's not a reason for keeping things secret, and especially if you want to clear these things up, and if you want to answer these questions, and especially the way this is this was being done uh, and handled by the government is not how you can um, find out how this actually worked. Um, but the opposition was not the only group um, who was angry. There was also the G10 Commission, uh, which was um, supposed to create 10 orders, couldn't see these selectors. What what this um, NSA committee could now see were um, the BND um, selectors, but they still haven't seen the NSA selectors. All of these trials are going to take some time if you sue someone. It takes a bit, possibly years, if we're unlucky. And until then, there are going to be some more uh, interesting people who will testify. For example, Angela Merkel, who we're expecting in the committee at some point. Also, among other people, the uh, Minister of the Interior, Thomas de Maizière, and uh, someone I'm really looking forward to uh, is Joschka Fischer. I think he's a really interesting um, figure in this because he was foreign minister and he was vice chancellor when this whole thing started. Basically, after 9-11 um, in 2011, that is when cooperation between secret services in the US and Germany really uh, grew because at that point everyone was swearing a uh, limitless solidarity to everyone and they kind of had to fulfill these promises. And so at that point this corporation actually really started. I also think this Mr. Fischer is really interesting because at some point in an interview he said that we wouldn't be able, without this corporation in the era of security, we wouldn't be able to survive. It's essential for us. So I think it's interesting um, to talk to someone who has this uh, attitude um, about how, when and how this whole thing started. Um, another person we're waiting for is Edward Snowden. We have all heard about um, this whole excitement about whether they should interview him, whether he should come to Germany, whether that would be safe, safe whether they shouldn't Skype with him. Um, and this whole thing d developed into such a farce that Glenn Glen Greenwald, who's actually invited, who said, well, if you, if this is such a ridiculous 
ridiculous thing where you're only creating the illusion of actually um, bringing up results, then I'm not going to come. So he was invited, but he declined. So I think that's actually a really important thing to say. It's a really important quote. We need to be aware this, that this committee can actually end up being a mere theater, a mere facade. And that's something that's maybe less likely to happen thanks to the members of the committee, but more from the government that is actually pro actively trying to prevent anything from coming out of this. Another question is, should this um, committee actually have a bigger, broader question? Should it have a bigger task? So, so far, um, it just says, oh, it's got something to do with the five eyes, which you're supposed to look into. But the longer this whole thing takes, the longer they actually realize, the more they actually realize that it's not only the evil five eyes, who are using us, making us into means for their ends and are profiting from the deals with us, but that actually our own Federal Intelligence Service and the other um, secret services that we have in Germany are actually using this for their own work and for getting information for themselves. Um, for example, by looking at these uh, BND selectors, the German selectors, that was something that was very interesting, or might be very interesting. So there are arguments for that and some against it. Something I am skeptical about, if you actually broaden the scope of the committee, that the limited time that you already have in the committee, if you add even more fields of interest and of inquiry for this committee. I'm not sure if you can actually get anywhere, if you can actually interview everyone who should be interviewed, especially considering that there's all this maneuvering um, where members of government are inviting people who don't really have anything to say and who basically just sat at a desk and didn't really contribute and who are just being invited to kill time. And then, of course, there's going to be even more paperwork. The people who work for the members of parliament um, are limited. They don't have unlimited work. They have, don't have unlimited time, there's other stuff they have to do. And another qu uh, possibility would be um, instituting a different committee that is more looking at what happened inside the German secret service, the German intelligence service. That would actually be um, more interesting. There is a minority quota where the opposition could decide by itself to institute this. But again, there's the problem of limited resources. There are actually other parliamentary committees already um, in the par in parliament. So, well, the whole thing is really interesting, and I'm very very interested and excited to see how this is going to end up. I think we shouldn't uh, stick with the status quo that we have right now because it's not really enough. Something that has to come out of this committee are reforms. At least that's what's becoming clearer and increasingly clear right now, especially because the BND is it's not really controlled in any way. We're a bit scared because other parliamentary committees that looked into affairs with the BND, we, in the past we learned that every time something like this comes out, you, then they just usually changed the way they did this and it was made constitutional. So basically what the BND was doing anyway was made legal. And that was really clear when, for example, the space theory came up. That's when somebody said, who uh, just said, well, then we just need to make sure that this is constitutional. So basically we just write into the laws that we have that this is all legal and constitutional. And this would basically lead into a situation where we just have exactly the same thing, the same bullshit, and we just legalized it. The BND, the intelligence service, can do what it wants, and it's basically out of control. And if we stand in front of an apparatus like this, we actually need to, it, which it, whose task it is to work in secret, whose task it is to cheat um, its direct superiors, and who doesn't talk to the parliament. How can um, an institution like this work within a democracy? And isn't this something that we can't? actually work with. And so whoever paid attention knows that I'm almost done now. There's one thing I was still missing. What do the Illuminati have to do with all of this? So I researched this. I didn't know anything about this. And then I found um, this domain. If you click on it, you're directed to the website of the NSA. And of course, if you eat it backwards, then it says Illuminati. I've also heard from people who actually thought about this, conspiracy theorists, who thought about what this meant. And one of these people actually emailed the guy who owns this domain and asked who this is. Um, the guy who owns it is uh, John Pelley. What did you want with this? Um, is there anything behind it? And what's the plan for the new world order? And the guy said, he, he laughed his ass off. 
and said well he couldn't uh, he, he couldn't keep himself from simply directing all traffic that came to this website to the NSA so maybe the Illuminati don't have that much to do with this after all Ein letzter Appell. So, one last appeal. Go to the committee. Everything we do can't replace people and can't replace what's happening in and the Polar Ranger Committee itself. I know, of course, not everyone lives in Berlin, not everybody has time on a Thursday morning or a Thursday afternoon, but if you have the time, go. Go at it, look, um, experience the atmosphere, look at the demeanor of these people, how they present themselves. We have so many different characters. Some are so convinced of themselves and so sure of themselves and say, well, everything's okay. There are people who suddenly become very, very small and where you can see their bad conscience in their face right away. And you should also watch what's happening in the um, macros. I often don't see it because I'm typing, but because, for example, when the chancery is becoming nervous and they're nervously typing things into their smartphones and they're leaving, then you know that something important is happening. And when the, uh, when the guys in the back row are sleeping, then you know, well, this is not very exciting right now. Another thing that I think is really important is that it's important to signal that there's a lot of interest in the parliamentary committee from the public and that the public wants to know about this. And I think if the more interest there is, the more they will realize that this is not something they can simply pull off without any actual results, but this is actually something that reaches a lot of people in Germany. So I was really, really happy, happy when I saw a um, school class in this committee at some point where their politics teacher went there with them to tell them, well, this is something we need to know about. And I think this is really... Um, a current history, um, which is some, uh, which is something you won't be able to see anywhere else. Popcorn sadly isn't allowed. If you're a visitor, and the best thing is, um, it's that it's really easy to register. You just send an email to one dot It's on the slides. You tell them which uh, day, uh, which day you're going to want to come. You tell them their your name. Um, uh, where you were born and when. If you haven't done this yet, and if you won't have the possibility to do this, um, I have another recommendation. I would I recommend the podcast uh, Technische Aufklärung. It's a podcast in German, which is always recorded after uh, the meetings of the committee. Sometimes I'm there, sometimes there are other people who go to a lot of these um, meetings. Um, if you want to do this today, and if you want to listen to one of these today, we are going to do a live episode um, today at the Zendet Centrum at uh, 6.15 in the evening. If you want some more entertainment and actually want to bring some popcorn, you can um, come at 15 minutes past midnight to uh, Hall 2 because there's going to be a reading where people read from the saddest and the most absurd scenes from this committee. And I hope that we will actually be able to talk about this a bit so none of these things are made up, so all of these things are real, we've witnessed all of them. Well, another thing is do something, be active, go to the streets, tell um, the government that you're not satisfied with this, you're not okay with this, help people to leave, um, help people to leave secret services. And if you know anyone here, if, if there's anyone here in the Secret Service, leave the Secret Service, there's help. And if you're still kind of part of this and you want to relieve your conscience a bit, um, there is a post service in Germany. Um, you can send us letters, maybe that helps you. And of course, there aren't only post boxes, there's also email, there are also email addresses. Um, you can send all your documents there where you think that this is something, that there is something in these documents um, that shouldn't happen like that. You can also um, contact me personally, that's how this works, and that's how, with that I'm done, and I hope there's some time for questions. Super, Anna, danke, super. Wir haben über zehn Minuten noch für Fragen. Äh, wir haben Saalmikrofone vorbereitet. Bitte nicht einfach reinschreien, weil die Fragen werden nicht im, im, im Stream gehört. Wir hätten gerne, dass die Fragen in den Saalmikrofon gestellt werden. Wir haben... Please ask questions in the microphones in the, in the room. There's four, three and two. You can see them. Please queue and then ask questions. People who are leaving now, please be quiet. What microphone should we start with? Number three, please. I have a short question. Can the committee can the committee put people in 
people people in, in in prison if they don't want to say something. Well, yes, they are obliged to answer truthfully and um, completely, so they also have to actually have to say everything they can, not what they want. And the committee can technically also fine uh, people, but no, they can't um, put people in prison. But so far, no fines have been imposed, even if sometimes I wouldn't have uh, stayed so calm like members of the committee when uh, you had people sitting there who were just like, well, the, what I'm saying is not part of the scope of what you're supposed to look into and just don't say anything. And so, so also because we don't know what we don't know and what the whole truth is, it's also extremely difficult to tell people you're, you're not saying something. All right, we have a short here, number two. The question is a similar flavor. What about these things that just came out about the problems? What direct direct results can we expect? How does how does the G10 Commission say there? Well, why didn't they just stand there and say say, well, we can't allow any more allow any more? Why isn't anyone being punished for saying the wrong, lying in the road, or for other crimes? As far as I know, I don't think that's possible because we don't know if someone is lying. We don't have the complete picture yet. And it's even more difficult, it's becoming even more difficult. There are even like more and more testimonials and sometimes these the things these people say don't match up. And sometimes you also see, like it seems like they're devising some responsibility where they're saying, well, maybe this person is, it's this person's fault and all the people who are more important then say, well, it's not really our fault, it's this other person's fault. And there was this testimonial about this one BND person who said they're not going to be any disciplinary uh, consequences. So he's basically telling, well, say, telling these people, well, even if you made mistakes and if you violated the rules, at least from our side, you don't have to fear anything. Well, that's that's why we want to know uh, from a point of penal law. What's uh, is that, are there any any consequences? I'm not legally trained, so I can't give you a reliable answer there. So I'm sorry. Thank you. Number four, please. Has, has anyone tried to check what the legal fundaments? Uh, like in detail what the root sort of legal foundations are here so for example um, like um, un un international law there's one testimonial from this Mr. Graulich who said that um, based, on the inter based on public international law spying is allowed and I think that's where you need to realize that this is about details it's about one, choosing one word over another, it's about choosing what to call something. Do we call this virtual foreign lands? Do we call this Germany? And I think we need to realize that we don't really have a legal means to say that this is completely legal, this is a gray area that the BND may constructed for itself. Some of these things are definitely illegal, for others it's much less clear. And you have people who are experts, some of these experts who then say, um, who actually said that most of what the BND says is illegal. So in many cases it's actually clear. But the question is that we need to decide what um, legal consequences it's going to have. But as long as we have this big coalition, social democrats and conservatives, it's not really going to happen that it's becoming clear that this is illegal. Yeah, well, I mean, you could really dig, dig dig a lot deeper there and look at what exactly on what basis, on what basic law you've mentioned earlier, like to, to what extent is it really valid, really? We, we, we should remember that the, the government is also needs to follow this and that indeed they, the Secret Service also is needs to follow this. We also need to think about who these basic laws are valid for, because it's completely bullshit to assume that the basic law is only, um, is only there for people who are German and everyone else is, well, lo locked out, uh, didn't lock out. And we need to get away from this whole attitude, we need to get away from the distinguishing between people uh, based on them being Germans and not. We can't simply destroy privacy of people. But as long as the BND has these interesting attitudes and understandings, like people who are in important positions don't have these basic rights that we actually grant all Germans, then there you need the will to make clear statements, you need decisions from courts, but that's going to take a while. Number two, please. 
you, you mentioned earlier that these people are, need to say the truth, which is to say they are not under oath. What is the situation there with, um, with uh, failures? And what if someone says something untrue? Is someone, is someone, does someone have an eye on this and check if there's, if there's any statutory limitation on these things? Again, I don't know. I didn't study law. Sorry. Und die sechs bitte. Number six, please. Ben Riegel said refused to come. Do you think it was a good idea or do you think it was a bad idea? I thought it was a shame, just personally, from a personal point of view. I think it's a loss, at least for the public, not knowing what he would have had to say about it, but I also think it was a good signal saying that if you're just playing theater here, if you're just pretending, if you're just playing a charade, then I'm not participating. So I think we need people who refuse to participate in this. Um, people in Germany can't really do that because they have to come, they're legally obliged to go once they're invited. But I think in the end, this was a good decision. The question is what the consequences are going to be of this. If maybe some, they're actually going to interview Snowden in the end, but we'll see. Number five, please, longer queue. I like the lighting in the room. Well, I have a lot of good sense of uh, TV optics. I wanted to ask, I didn't, I would like to ask if you, if you can't even get the answer on who, who is the technician, how can you, how can you make the promise, elect, leave the, the intelligence? What if someone says, to, comes to you and leaves, I want to leave the secret service, are they also left alone? Well, those are two different issues. Our TV team is here. They like to take questions. These are the qualified people who you should ask. Thanks. And Finally, switching live on number two. Thanks for amazing technology. Thank you very much for the amazing talk and the good work. Ich habe aber auch noch eine Frage. But I still have a question as well. The question is, well, we know how much, how often these these interrogations of asylum seekers, do we know if these asylum seekers, the people who are being interviewed, are they under pressure? Are they being, are they, do they think they had to do this? Do they think it was a normal part of the procedure if you are looking for asylum in Germany? Did they know who they were talking to? That I would like to know what, what do we actually know about this process? We have quite a bit of information about this. I think the exact number, I don't know about it, but I think there were about 300 interviews per year, at least in the times where it was very rampant. Of course, when there are more asylum seekers coming, there's more. When there's less, there's less. And then in the end, they were kind of losing personnel because they were not being terribly efficient, apparently. So at some point, it got less. About regarding pressure, that's a difficult question because everything that they're telling us and all this they're promising us, where they're saying, oh no, they were told that it's voluntary and that it's not going to have any influence um, on their claim to asylum. But so this institution is, doesn't have anything to do with granting asylum, so it doesn't have any power to um, give these things to asylum seekers. But we also know that there are cases where these asylum seekers were interesting for the BND, and the BND intervened in these um, processes for their asylum process where they intervened and where they said this person is interesting for us and then they basically told the ministry that is responsible for this um, and told this ministry to stall the process of for asylum and if this um, for the, the BND to say whether it's interesting or not and then they might say that there are extra reasons there are new reasons then um, for example, once somebody finds out um, in their home country that they talk to the intelligence service, then well, then you can stay. But what we don't know is how much did these asylum seekers who were being interviewed about the person who was interviewing them, they presented themselves as not being part of the intelligence service, they presented themselves as being part of the security service in the chancellery. But of course, most people who are from outside Germany, just as most people inside of Germany, wouldn't know about this. And also something you should wonder is, do these people talk about it? It's probably going to be spread around. People will know um, whose asylum claims were granted, whose weren't. 
And of course, they can say that's not going to have any influence. But how believable is that if somebody um, is in a situation where they're be under a lot of pressure, where they actually need this asylum, where they can say, well, maybe it's all voluntary, but for these people, it might not actually be. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Anna, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Your hand, your your applause for you. If you have further questions, do you know what she looks like? Um, I don't think you have anything against people to talk to me. No, I'm, I'm here a couple more days. Good. To